chapter 10, continuing on with page 249. So let's talk about meat. A lot of times students don't want to talk about meat because they love meat, but these are the issues that you need to know concerning meat. So eating meat affects the environment a lot more than eating vegetables or grains or breads because if you remember back to trophic levels, as you go up a trophic level, you lose 90% of the energy when you go up a trophic level. So let's say we grow grains to eat, like you know rice and oats and wheat and breads, and instead of turning that grain into crackers or pasta, instead we feed that grain to cattle, and then we slaughter it and turn it into a hamburger. Well, we've just lost 90% of that grain through the animal's metabolism. So it's not available for us to eat. So when we take the food and we feed it to animals instead, we need 10 times more land to grow the food because remember, we're gonna lose a lot. We need more pesticides, 10 times more fertilizers and fossil fuels to grow the same amount of calories of meat versus if we just ate the plants. And you're like, well, I don't like vegetables. Well, you also, I mean, this is grains too. So these are your bread products. So the other issue with livestock is it pollutes the air with methane, which is a greenhouse gas. Nitric oxide is an air pollutant and a greenhouse gas and carbon dioxide, which is a greenhouse gas. And these all contribute to climate change. The figures and captions down here are important because they show you how much is lost. So for beef, it's actually not a 90% loss, it is a 95% loss, so it's the worst of them. And then a little bit less for pork and eggs, chicken and milk. And so if you wanna be a little eco-friendly, um, reduce the amount of meat that you eat. Choose more from this area than from this area as much as you can. Even if people met, went meatless one day a week, it would have a significant impact on the environment. On this page, it shows us our land required to produce a kilogram of protein. And so the most eco-friendly is eating chickens actually, and the least is beef. And this is water use. So huge amounts of water to grow a kilogram of beef versus the other products here. And then on the bottom, we have some issues with agriculture and the way that we raise our chickens and our cattle in particular. Pigs are actually not much better either. Pigs are also grown in huge um, factory farms. So there's some issues concerning these huge industrialized meat operations that the majority of our meat comes from. So, the problems that occur with animal agriculture include air pollution, the, and part of air pollution is the smell. If you live near a feedlot, that's a terrible smell. And it also produces nitrous oxide gas, um, which is an air pollutant. It also is also a greenhouse gas. So methane's produced, CO2's produced as well. So we have air pollution and we have greenhouse gases. Animal agriculture also produces surface and groundwater pollution. Nitrogen and phosphate can run off into waterways and we know those cause eutrophication. Other bacteria and viruses as well can run off and we've had some people die from feedlots down here, the manure running off into spinach fields. And so about 10 years ago, we had spinach recalls because of E. coli bacteria that got into the spinach and it killed a few people. Now these places are overcrowded and so they put antibiotics in the feeds to kill any pathogens. Well, what's it's happened in, in the world is we have an increase in antibiotic resistance. And so when you eat this meat, you are eating trace amounts of antibiotics which can cause resistance in to human population over time. All right, so moving on to aquaculture. Aquaculture has some positives and negatives, so make sure that, no, well, first of all, aquaculture is fish farming, where we take fish and we grow them in pens. 
there are some good things with aquaculture and then there are some negative things with aquaculture as well. So make sure you know both of them. Know the definition of a seed bank over here. So as we lose genetic diversity with monocultures and genetically modified foods, there are scientists that are collecting seeds to store in the future in case we need that genetic diversity. And here's a picture of one down here, the Doomsday Seed Vault, which is freezing samples of seeds. Going on to page 254. Pollinators are in trouble, and pollinators are really important. So, um, first of all, pollinators are more than bees. Flies pollinate, wasps, beetles, hummingbirds, bats, and moths. And let's talk about bats a little bit. It's not in your book, but it's a really important topic that is um, possibly on an AP test in the near future. So bats are really, really important ecologically. They eat pests, so they're natural biocontrol, and they also pollinate. Right now, bats are in trouble from something called white nose syndrome, which is a fungus that invades a cave that they hibernate in over the winter, and it's actually irritating to them. So the fungus doesn't kill them, but what happens is that they keep waking up to scratch their noses, and they use all kinds of energy. And this depletes their energy reserves and so they either die from starvation before the winter is up, or they try and fly out of the cave in the winter and look for things to eat, but there aren't anything to eat in the winter in a lot of these really cold places. And so bats are in trouble, and we, uh, even if you don't like bats, you need to understand that they provide huge amounts of ecosystem services for us. So bees do as well, and bees are suffering from colony collapse disorder. And so bees are in trouble everywhere, and we think it's a combination of pesticides and mites, M-I-T-S. And so basically when I say know it, make sure you read all about what's going on with colony collapse disorder. All right, so we're going to move on to pesticides. We have different kinds of pesticides. A pest is anything that's unwanted, which can include an insect or a weed or a fungus. Our strawberries and berries are sprayed with a lot of fungicide to kill fungus. All right, so here's some add-ons to um, the book about different kinds of pesticides. First of all, you need to know that a synthetic pesticide is man-made from chemicals. An example is strychnine and then DDT. A chlorinated hydrocarbon can also be synthetic. These aren't different kinds, they're just different categories, and some things can fit into both categories. Chlorinated hydrocarbons are made from petroleum oil, and they are considered the worst, and a lot of them cause birth defects, and a lot of them are banned in the United States. DDT is banned in the United States. And then we have another category, and some of these things can fit into all these categories. But we have broad spectrum pesticides, which kill a wide variety of insects instead of just a target one. But when you spray a broad spectrum pesticide, you're going to kill good things like bees that are essential for pollination. All right, this picture down here shows the pesticide treadmill. Um, basically, you spray a crop, you kill almost everybody, but not all of the bugs. Those bugs with the good DNA mate, and now your new batch of bugs have all this um, good DNA that their parents had, and then you spray them with the same pesticide, they don't die, so then you have to go to another pesticide that's stronger and more powerful, and so then those bugs get stronger and the pesticides get stronger, and so we call it a pesticide treadmill, and we talked about evolutionary arms race before, so this is an, is an example of an evolutionary arms race. Okay, page 256. We have some natural ways to get rid of pests, and one of those is biocontrol, where we introduce a predator of 
uh, a species we want to get rid of. So we've done it successfully in some places, like with the cactus moth, and there's a picture down here. And then uh, with Bt bacteria, that's a successful one. It's a soil bacterium that kills, or produces a protein that kills caterpillars and some fly and beetle larvae. And so farmers will spray Bt on their um, crops, their spores, to prevent an insect attack. Uh, organic farmers use Bt bacteria a lot because um, it's not a synthetic pesticide, it's a natural pesticide. So there are some drawbacks to biocontrol. Basically, if you introduce an animal to control something, you have to do a lot of extensive tests because you could inadvertently introduce an invasive species. They did this in Australia with the cane toad that was supposed to kill cane beetles, but it didn't and became an invasive species. Here are the best pesticides for the health of the environment. Bt bacteria is the best. Brachinoid wasps are wasps that will go into your crops and kill the bad bugs. See, wasps are carnivores, not herbivores, so the wasps won't eat the crops, but they'll eat the other bugs. Insecticidal soap is basically just a, a soap that covers and suffocates the bugs. And so it doesn't have those toxins that are bad for then humans to eat the crops. And then toxic plant derivatives. Some plants like poison ivy have a toxin in them and you can spray that on your plants. Now, we don't use poison ivy because then when humans touch the crops, they would get a rash. But there are other types of toxic plants that we could spray that we do spray on crops to prevent the bugs from eating them. Okay, so one way that farmers can control their pests instead of just massive spraying with pesticide is something called IPM, Integrated Pest Management. So on this page, uh, actually down here at the bottom of 256, it talks about integrated pest management. Make sure you know what it is, which is all of these different kinds of things habitat alteration, crop rotation, transgenic crops. Um, you can spray pesticide a little bit here, um, some mechanical pest removal, sometimes by hand. And so when you have a lot of different methods to prevent pests, you also prevent the pesticide treadmill. And that's really a good thing to do. On this page, we introduce organic agriculture so know the organic provisions, which is in table 10.1. Actually, yes, 10.1. 10 the basic provisions are that you can't have genetically modified crops in organic agriculture. You cannot have synthetic pesticides or fertilizers. You can't have pesticides, it just can't be man-made. So that's the difference between organic and conventionally grown crops, which is the regular ones. Okay, on page 259, so we have here this case study, the science behind the stories. And in this uh, part, the very last part of the um, article, it shows the benefits of organic farming and the benefits including include creating more topsoil, so it less erosion and more decomposition into your topsoil. Mm -hmm. More microbes, which are the good things that you want in your soil, bacteria, fungus, beetle larvae, those kinds of things make for healthy soil. And again, overall healthy soil. Going on to page 261. Okay, so now we're gonna talk about genetically modified crops and we will pick this up in the next video.